Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Lynn O'Hara and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. And we are so excited and thrilled to be joined by all of the teachers and coordinators in our inspiring student research webinar series this fall. We are excited to have over 200 teachers and coordinators live in the program this year. And we could not be doing that without the generosity of our sponsors, the Library of Congress, 400 Years of African American History Commission, and BBVA Bank. So I just want to make sure we say thank you up front to those who are allowing my colleague, Elena McNaughton, who's our NHD contest manager, and Dr. Chris Capazzola from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So before we dive into our topic tonight, we just want to do a couple quick housekeeping items. First off, we cannot see you, we cannot hear you. If you're finishing dinner, don't worry about it. Um, you can communicate with us through the question and answer box. Elena and I will be monitoring it. We'll do a big Q&A session at the end, but if there's something really pressing, we'll throw it in as we go. We do have live captioning turned on tonight. Live captioning is computer generated. It's not perfect. Sometimes it's funny, um, but it can be helpful if you find it useful. If you don't find it useful, that's fine. Just find your Zoom toolbar. I think it's live CC button. Just click it once. It'll turn it off. If you just change your mind, you can click it again to turn it back on. So here's how this works. You've registered for the webinar and you're here. Congratulations. In order to earn your credit, you have to complete the survey that will give out the link at the end. And that's required to get your attendance credit. We know that you got all the way through the program. We have got the slides and the bibliography posted to Google Classroom already, and we'll add the video tomorrow morning once it processes. Um, so if you want to see it again, if you go, you know, I really like that picture, I want to grab that for my eighth graders, we'll have, we've got everything there. It's under module one, it's called webinar one materials. Module two is going to launch tomorrow. It actually might launch late tonight um, so that you will have it and can jump into the next piece because the first deadline in module two, your initial post to the discussion board is due Monday, September 27th, midnight on the East Coast. All right. Those are the general announcements. But now what I'd like to do is turn things over to Dr. Capazzola. Dr. Capazzola started working with us in our World War I webinar series a few years ago. And when we had this you know, idea and this opportunity to work initially with the Library of Congress, we called him up and he was gracious enough to join us. And my understanding, and I might just give this away, is that before you were a professor, you were in fact a seventh grade teacher. Is that correct? Uh, seventh, eighth and ninth grade social studies. Excellent. So he's an awesome professor to have on our team. What we're going to do, Elaine and I are actually going to turn our cameras off. We're going to turn the first part of the program over. We'll come back in the second part to talk about some ideas and ways to inspire student research and kind of hook your students into some cool and interesting NHD topic ideas. Uh, but for right now, thank you for joining us, Chris, and we're going to sign off and let you take over the show. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so thanks to Lynn and to Elena. Um, and it's good to sort of be part of this year's um, inspiring student research webinar. I'm going to take a second right now and share my screen. Um, so and start the show. So you should be able to see that. Um, if anybody's having any technical troubles along the way, just pop something into the Q&A and we can try to address that. Um, so as Lynn said, um, I teach American history here at MIT, um, and I've been doing that for about 20 years, um, but I did get my start um, teaching 7th, 8th, and ninth grade social studies, um, also with focus on English language learner students. Um, so, you know, I've, I've, uh, you know, I really kind of been, um, have those kind of interests at, at heart and have those classroom experiences and want to sort of leave some time in the Q&A for really thinking about how this works in your classroom, because I think the most important question about any kind of professional development um, workshop is not you know, what you learned, but what you're going to do with it um, after afterward. I'm going to dive into a few things. But before we do, because we have a whole series of, of meetings over the fall, I wanted to spend a moment or two just talking about diplomacy, right, um, and about debate, um, spending a second on those terms, which will help us get to tonight's topic, which is Native American history and US diplomatic history, and how those two are connected and how um, and why it is that we tend not to think of them um, in the same ways. 
Um, and so let me just start a little bit with, um, with some, some guiding questions, which you've seen um, in, in the sort of uh, discussion boards, which you've already thought about. Uh, who, who is a diplomat and what is diplomacy? How do Native Americans use these institutions uh, to claim nationhood and sovereignty? I'll talk more about that word sovereignty in a minute. Um, and when treaties were broken, how did Native Americans and their allies uh, challenge the, the, that fact, in particular uh, challenging Indian the Indian Removal Act of 1830? Um, and then at the end, we'll, uh, and along the way, we'll spend some time thinking about how teachers and students can use the Library of Congress to research and find these sources, um, looking in particular at things like treaties, petitions, editorials, and other kinds of sources like the ones that you looked at for tonight. Now, I want to start with, with, um, with this first question of what is diplomacy and who is a diplomat, um, and get at a, a sort of question of sort of what is the difference between debate and diplomacy? Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to just sort of jot down a couple of thoughts, um, and we, don't, we won't necessarily have time to put them all in the Q&A. But um, this is the very beginning of the semester. Think of this almost like a pretest. Um, uh, just write down one or two se uh, sentences, a couple keywords, put them somewhere so that you can go back to them a month from now or in December when we have our fourth session. So just take a second. And then I'm going to give you a couple more uh, questions to keep you busy along the way. Right? Um, this is a yes or no question. Can you win a debate? Um, again, sort of jot this down um, for yourself. Um, yes or no? What's your gut answer to that question? Second or third, can you win at diplomacy? Right? Um, are there winners and losers? Right? Spend a second and just give yourself a yes or a no, and then jot that down. And now here's another one. And here, I actually do want to encourage you, um, you know, maybe not all two, you know, 120 people, um, but, you know, encourage, uh, if you're inspired, to just try to use the Q&A to, um, to drop some, some things into this. Um, what is the opposite of debate? Um, or what is the opposite of diplomacy? So if you have some, um, if you have some answers to this, um, not to the definition. Um, sometimes it's easier to find the definition of a word by seeing um, what is its opposite. So while we know from our debate coach, Molly, that, uh, that you can win a debate. Um, so some people say the opposite of, of diplomacy is war, right? Um, that war represents a failure of diplomacy. We'll definitely see that over the course um, uh, of the next few months. Right, um, that um, the opposite is of is collaboration, right? Um, or the opposite of debate is agreement, right? Um, or um, Corey says the opposite of debate is arguing, right? That a debate is a structured conversation as opposed to just sort of yelling at each other, right? Um, and lots of awesome things in here, right? The opposite is of debating is concurring, right? Um, that the opposite, Samantha says the opposite of diplomacy is conquest. Um, these are all great, um, and you know, feel free to just keep them going, and maybe you know, we'll sort of like uh, save them at the end of the evening and, and go back to it. But make sure that in addition to putting it in the Q and A, you're writing it down somewhere that you can come back to this later, right? And so there's a reason that I did this, right? I wanted um, uh, I wanted us to be able uh, to sort of think about our terms and our definitions so that we can think about them as broadly as possible. Because what you're going to see if you're looking at uh, at the readings for this week and the month ahead, months ahead, is that I'm, I'm going to push you to debate uh, or to define words like debate and diplomacy as broadly as you can, right? Um, and the reason to do that is that it helps us think more broadly about who we are talking about when we read history and when we teach history, right? And it also encourages students to see themselves as participants in history, to see themselves participating in debates, participating in diplomacy, not just watching those from the sidelines, right? It sort of empowers students from a civic perspective um, to get more involved in their communities, in their countries, and in the world, right? Um, now, along the way, one of the other things we have to do um, is think about what are the sources? What's the historical record of diplomacy, right? Um, and here I wanna just uh, spend a second on, on sources and primary sources. And I'll just start with a very basic reminder because I know some people are new 
to history as a field. Some people are new to teaching, they're pre-service teachers who are on the call. Um, just what's the difference between a primary and a secondary source? Some of you know this very well, but for those of you who are new, right, primary sources are the materials that we use to build an interpretation. They are the things created in the past at the time. Letters, diaries, newspapers, political cartoons, quantitative data, archeological evidence, and of course, in our case, treaties, petitions, letters, editorials, things that you saw in the sources in the packet tonight. Secondary sources are the various accounts and interpretations that have, are built later, usually by scholars or journalists or local historians, others who use those primary sources, they use that evidence to build an, an interpretation to tell a story, right? So for example, the reading that you did from uh, Professor Colin Calloway about the Treaty of New Echota is a secondary source, right? So just a clarification there and sort of, you know, for those of you who are new to this. Now, if you want um, students to actually work with primary sources, right? We want them to work with sources like treaties, right? Like the ones that we looked at for tonight. Um, but they're not the only things that historians use when we think about diplomacy, right? Um, and they're also not the easiest thing to work with um, in the K-12 classroom. Um, and this came up a little bit in some of the discussion board postings, right? Um, that um, in diplomatic language, it can kind of be hard sometimes to read behind the line or between the lines, right? To understand sort of what are the motivations? What are the, you know, sort of what are the conflicts? What's really happening, right? And we have to kind of empower our students and model for our students how to kind of read a, a, a diplomatic document critically for perspective, for bias, for interest, for audience, all the things that we do whenever we engage with the source, right? Um, and then of course, also it's the language of, of past eras can be difficult, right? The 18th century um, can be challenging to kids in 2021 um, or to adults. Uh, it can be challenging for developing readers for, for ELL kids. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of figure out what's gonna work best for, for you, right? In your classroom and to kind of put these uh, sources into dialogue um, along the way. So, Making uh, definitions broad, using primary sources, uh, these are important ways to kind of uh, expand who are the actors in history. Um, and they also, in a way, uh, will push us to think differently about who is a winner and who is a loser. Uh, and that's why when I asked, um, you know, sort of, can you win a debate? Can you win at diplomacy? And the answer is, um, is not so easy. Right? Maybe it's yes, maybe it's no, or, but sometimes people um, don't always know um, whether, or you know, don't, have, don't know whether they're actually winning or losing. And history is long, um, longer than the lifetimes of any of us. Um, and so what looks like a loss in one moment um, can actually be the grounds for a victory in another time period. Right? All right, so let me dive into what we're going to do next. We're gonna look at uh, two moments of treaty making in US history. One in the founding period in the 1790s, one in the early Republic in the 1830s. And then we're gonna pay a little bit of attention after that to what happens in the 20th century to Native American treaties. We'll look at a series of sources, um, not that necessarily the treaties themselves, most of those because they're official government documents are on a sort of deposit at the National Archives or with the Native nations and their own historical repositories. And then we'll look at sort of sources about them, speeches, editorials, petitions, newspaper articles, um, and we'll sort of look at how scholars have, have been asking new questions about these. And in particular, we'll look at how Native nations are sort of at the, at the center of this history, claiming nationhood itself, right? Um, and so that's why you'll notice tonight, um, that I will repeatedly use the phrase Native nations, right? Or Native governments, Native states, um, rather than a language like people or tribe. Right, words that are often used, um, often even by native people or in, uh, American Indians themselves. Um, but, uh, and there's a range of ways of using these terms and, and in the, the NHD packet, you'll notice um, there's a link to a very good site at the National Museum of the American Indian of the Smithsonian that sort of talks you through these kinds of terms and helps you work with students to kind of master those. Um, but I think that you'll also find that one of the reasons I'm doing this is to draw attention to questions of nationhood international relations and treaty relations between the United States and the native nations of North America. All right, um, so let's jump in and look at, at the next section. Um, and in particular, um, I wanna spend a moment in the 1790s looking at the Treaty of Canandaigua. Um, 
And we'll start when, uh, with a very familiar face. Right? Um, we will start here uh, with George Washington. Right? Um, and George Washington, um, by the 1790s, had had a lifetime of experience um, with Native people. Um, of course, he had fought against Native nations um, in the Seven Years' War in the American Revolution. He had surveyed Indian lands um, as a young man. He had speculated in, uh, in Indian land um, for real estate purposes. Um, but by the 1790s, um, he is sending Postmaster General Timothy Pickering um, to Canandaigua, which is a small city in uh, far western New York, uh, not that far from, uh, from Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, near what's now Buffalo, um, sent there uh, because uh, the United States wants to engage um, with the Seneca Nation um, in order to obtain sort of land rights in the region um, and also uh, to, and, and transit rights and transport rights um, for uh, sort of the far western parts of the Great Lakes. Now to do this, um, Washington and, and the US officials understand that they need to actually formalize a treaty um, with the Haudenosaunee, um, the five nations that are often known as the Iroquois, right, the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, uh, Oneida and Mohawks, um, and four of those five nations uh, participate in uh, the Treaty of Canandaigua. Right? Um, and so the question is, why is Washington going there to make a treaty? Right? And the answer is actually really quite simple. Right? It's the same reason um, that, he, that leads Washington in the same year, 1794, to send Secretary of State John Jay to formalize the Jay Treaty um, with Great Britain. Right? That uh, treaty making is how nations interact with each other. They formalize relationships and they clarify definitions and understandings. And they do this in the hope of avoiding conflict over, over land, over military forces, um, over anything that might be bringing nations in contact. But notice this is a uh, two way street, right? Uh, they may not be equal nations, um, but they treat one another as nations. Right? Um, and they recognize the nationhood and sovereignty, which is to say sort of the right over one's own territory um, uh, in, in the form of a treaty. Right? So in that sense, you know, I, I kind of think it's important to treat uh, the Treaty of Canandaigua like Jay's treaty. Right? These are sort of things that are in our textbook, but they're often in sort of separate sections of the textbook. And we could probably do better by putting them together, right? helping us think about them at the same time. Now, of course, um, as this is happening, um, sort of this is actually the, the culmination in many ways of, of years of, of, of communication between the Haudenosaunee or Six Nations um, and the, the new nation of the United States. Right? And this was one of the documents that you saw in the packet for tonight, where we see all the way back in 1776, the Six Nations addressing George Washington right? at a time when the, the, the outcome of the American Revolution is not clear. Uh, Washington's status is as a military commander, not as a president, right? And this kind of communication continues, right? Um, and the forms of diplomacy that are engaged in um, are sort of ones that both nations take seriously and have long traditions of, right? That the United States is a new nation, but they're bringing in new, they're bringing with them British traditions of diplomacy, European traditions that involve a written record, that involves sort of formal representations, um, these kinds of things. But the Haudenosaunee have a similar approach. Um, for them, um, treaty making is something that they had also engaged in for as far as we can tell for decades, even centuries before the arrival uh, of Europeans in North America. Um, and their diplomacy and treaty making involved sort of long periods of negotiation, communication, again, definition of terms, coming to terms, um, so both are bringing histories of negotiation and diplomacy together, right? That, that this is not necessarily at first glance, the imposition of a US diplomatic order on the six nations, right? But the sort of, it's a, a, a dialogue and a back and forth diplomatically between the Haudenosaunee and the United States. Now in 1790, George Washington addressed the Seneca Nation. This is a document that is available from the Library of Congress. Um, it's uh, uh, and widely, it's not actually in the packet, but we can add it to the um, we can add it to the, the website after tonight's session. Here, once again, if you read these documents off over and over again, um, both countries promise to each other 
peace, friendship, brotherhood. Washington um, insists on what he calls mutual justice um, uh, between the two nations. There's also a bit of a tone of, as you read it, um, notice a tone of, of paternalism, right? Of condescension to the native nations. He writes, of course, the fatherly care the United States intends to take of the Indians, right? Uh, and Washington also insists um, that the quote, general government only has the power to treat with the Indian nations, right? And here I wanna stop for one second, just on that sentence, right? Washington says that gov general government only has the power to treat with the Indian nations, right? Now what he's doing there is telling the Seneca that, um, that they should only engage in treaty negotiations with the United States, that they should not necessarily sell land to individual land speculators, that they should not necessarily make deals with New York State, right? Um, and notice this is coming in the middle of, uh, uh, right after the ratification of the constitution, right after the Articles of Confederation, right? The sort of terms of the state and the, uh, and the federal governments are still very much in flux. Right? And Washington's effort to insist on federal authority over native treaty making is in part about to relations with foreign nations like the Seneca, but also about domestic issues um, in the United States as well. And so this theme um, we're gonna see sort of uh, in, in many different phases over the course of, of, uh, of the evening. But one thing that's very important to notice is that by the time we actually get to the Treaty of Canandaigua in 1794, um, and this is an image of the treaty itself, um, that, the, that the United States is consistently making formal treaties with native nations where even just 10 years before, in 1784, um, in the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, the United States was not really interested um, in sort of making and abiding by these treaties, right? And part of the reason for that um, is that the United States, as a sort of new nation, um, is trying to assert its own authority, um, both um, in North America and in the international community, uh, but also because they have to, right? Because the Haudenosaunee are a strong confederation of six nations, um, because they have military power, as one of the uh, optional readings pointed out, um, that the army of the Haudenosaunee in, in 1794 is larger than the army of the United States, right? Um, and so the United States has to make a deal, right? Um, and the Treaty of Canandaigua recognizes um, uh, native rights um, uh, in the region in exchange for sessions of land. Now, of course, um, this is the key that unlocks the door, right? Um, for land grabs, for land use, and for the dispossession of native nations um, in the, the Haudenosaunee and others, right? But it also includes in it um, a really crucial sort of part, which is the recognition of the Haudenosaunee as nations, right? Recognizing their sovereignty, recognizing that they are sort of sovereign over their own people and in some sense over their own land. Um, and this treaty system built in the 1780s and 90s doesn't protect Indian lands. It doesn't protect um, the, the full sovereignty of native nations, right? But it does recognize them as such. And that's going to matter. Uh, it may not matter for 200 more years, right? But it is an important recognition uh, and that it's built into this early phase of, of the American Republic. All right, so let me just keep going. We're, you know, we're gonna move fast through a lot of material this evening. So if you have questions, save them for the, the Q&A um, and I'll try to address as many as I can. Um, so I want to talk now and, and fast forward to the 1830s, right, um, and to a period from 1830 to 1835 that culminates in the Treaty of New Echota. Um, and here I want to just suggest that once again, um, we have to read treaties critically, right, because just because you're reading a, a treaty, just because you see that the document is a treaty, doesn't necessarily mean that you're seeing diplomacy as people defined it um, in the Q&A section um, earlier this evening. Right? Um, and so sometimes what you're seeing is politics by another means, right? Or war by another, by another name, right? And so I'm gonna just um, sort of look here for questions about how uh, Native Americans and their allies challenged uh, the breaking of treaties and challenged the Indian Removal Act. 
Um, and the story starts in the 1820s um, in sort of the regions um, that we would now recognize as Georgia, North Carolina, um, but also the traditional home of the Cherokee Nation. Um, the source that you're looking at here is an image from a newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, um, which was sort of published um, in New Echota, um, as you can see, published by the Cherokee Nation, which uh, in the 1820s is also not only publishing documents, is codifying its language. You can see the, the, the characters at the top here, um, and also sort of adopting, uh, ratifying their own constitution, using all, taking all of the steps to sort of prove um, to the United States that they are a sovereign nation um, and that they are a nation with which the United States must treat as an equal. Right? Um, and I sort of want you to kind of keep a, uh, an eye on this, this move, on this political effort. They are sort of, you know, sort of claiming sovereignty in as many ways as they can. Um, it's also a great source, right? Um, and it's available on the Library of Congress website um, through uh, the Chronicling America portal. And um, the entire thing is there and digitized. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's it, you know, it's a sort of, it's like swimming in the ocean. So it might take sort of guiding your students through it a little bit, but those sources are there. Um, and it's a great way for students to kind of get native voices in, in the first person and really kind of understand the, Cher um, the Cherokee Nation as they're sort of facing the threat of removal. Right now, the reason there's threat of, of removal is that there is, a, there is demand for land, right? That settlers in Georgia and North Carolina and Tennessee it sort of want um, sort of these traditional lands. Um, and the Indian Removal Act of 1830 authorizes the president, Andrew Jackson, to negotiate with native nations for the cession of their lands in the Southeast in exchange for territory in what is now Oklahoma, so-called Indian territory. Um, now, the Cherokee Nation is sort of challenging this um, through every means that they can. Um, and in particular, they are also finding um, allies wherever they can as well, trying to sort of build a, build an, an argument in popular culture, in journalism, through editorials, they're filing court cases, many of which come before the US Supreme Court. All of these are sort of, um, you know, sort of going uh, at the same time. Um, and one which is not uh, in your packet, um, and, but again, is a great source that you'll find um, in many different places, is that thousands of Americans who were not uh, members of the Cherokee Nation or any of the other uh, so-called five civilized tribes do actually get involved in this debate. Um, and I picked one almost at, at random um, because there are ten, literally tens of thousands of petitions that arrive, um, at, as you can see from this uh, source, addressed to the Honorable Senate and House of Representatives of the United States. That's at the bottom of the page. And it is a memorial, which is to say a, a kind of a petition from the ladies of Steubenville, Ohio, against the forcible removal of the Indians without the limits of the United States, meaning outside the United States. Right? So they are protesting the, the Indian Removal Act. They are against it. They're sending a petition to the House uh, and, and Senate of the United States, the Congress that will decide about this. Right? And here, this is an important sort of turning point in, in US history, but it also should make us think a little bit about, well, what is debate and what is diplomacy? Right? Um, and who gets to debate um, and who gets to be a diplomat. Right? That, that formal treaty negotiations um, are almost exclusively until the 20th century, uh, the preserve of men, right? and in particular of sort of uh, enfranchised white men um, in the 19th century. Right? Now this, uh, and for the ladies of Steubenville, Ohio, would have been excluded from the vote, would have been excluded from the House and Senate would have been excluded from the terms of diplomacy, but they are still finding a way, right? Now we certainly understand this as politics, right? And we probably teach about sort of how the women's rights movement um, that emerges in Seneca Falls in the 1840s, well, you know, sort of participates in popular politics before the vote is granted in 1920, right? So we teach about this as domestic politics, but what if we see the women of Steubenville, Ohio as diplomats? Right, as people who are expressing uh, opinions about what the foreign policy of the United States should be as it deals with um, the Cherokee Nation uh, and the other nations, right? That they are sort of writing themselves into diplomacy. They're sort of taking up space for diplomacy uh, in, in filing these petitions. Now they're also, um, you know, sort of uh, as, as one, as historian um, sort of uh, 
have shown, this is an important turning point for many women's organizations. That many of these women may not have seen themselves as political. Um, certainly in 1830 would not necessarily have wanted to claim the right to vote. Um, that would have been sort of a pretty radical step um, for, for them to take. Many of them are coming to this from their work in churches, right? particularly at Protestant evangelical churches after the second uh, sort of great awakening. Um, and this is sort of their finding a space in missionary work and religious work uh, to kind of make a claim, right? Um, and to participate in politics. And that's going to continue, right? As new social movements of the 19th century emerge, anti-slavery, um, temperance, right? Um, uh, women's rights, all of these. In some ways, uh, Indian removal and the protests against it are sort of the first big women's popular political movement of the 19th century. Right? That's an important US political history moment. It's also, I think, an important moment in US foreign relations. Right? Um, and that's also one of the ways that I like us to think critically about uh, sort of how we teach Indian removal. Now, for some of you, this history is new, um, and I hope, you know, that you are kind of doing the back, background reading and kind of getting up to speed on the history of it. But for those of you who are more experienced teachers, Indian removal is something we teach pretty much every year, right? Um, and it's in pretty much all the textbooks and we've taught it. But we tend to think of it as, again, a history of US domestic politics. We teach it as federal state relations, right? Who's in control here, Andrew Jackson or the state of Georgia? We teach it as a balance of powers issue, right? Who has control? President Andrew Jackson or Chief Justice John Marshall, right? That famous line, which Andrew Jackson probably never said, right? Well, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it, right? Um, but that's a history that sort of, in many ways, writes Native nations out of history. They write, it writes Native Americans out of that history, right? And then I think that's important for us to, to look at um, and to kind of rethink um, and reteach in new ways right? by taking um, this moment seriously as a moment of international relations as well as of US politics. Now, where this brings us um, at the end of the story, right, um, is, uh, is to removal itself. Um, that um, faced with the uh, sort of resistance of Native nations and, and of their white allies, um, Andrew Jackson basically refuses to deal with the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, John Ross. Um, and deals instead with a sort of subgroup um, of the Cherokee Nation, the so-called Treaty Party, right? Notice that term, uh, headed by John Ridge. Eventually, this smaller uh, sort of group signs the Treaty of New Echota in March of 1835, which cedes 8 million acres um, of land in what will be North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee, um, and cedes this to the United States in exchange for $4.5 million. The treaty is approved um, by this treaty party with a vote of 79 to seven. But if you're wondering whether it's a representative sample of uh, the Cherokee nation, bear in mind that soon thereafter, a petition with 12,000 signatures um, of Cherokee uh, nations uh, is sent in protest to the United States Senate. Um, but that, pro that petition um, doesn't go anywhere. Um, President Jackson continues um, to uh, sort of recognize the Treaty of New Echota um, uh, as a sort of binding document on the entire Cherokee Nation, right? So like I said, even when you're reading a treaty, um, we don't necessarily know what's behind the scenes, who's behind the story, right? And what can we, um, what can we necessarily sort of trust from this? This is the document that authorizes um, the sort of dispossession and removal of, of Native nations from the Southeastern United States. Um, and this is why I ask if, if treaties are always necessarily weapons of peace, or if sometimes they are also weapons of war. Um, what you can see here is the document, um, this, these are the orders um, from 1838, um, sort of uh, authorizing removal um, from uh, uh, this, from part of the Cherokee Nation, signed at the bottom um, by Winfield Scott, a military leader of the 19th century, right? So in 1794, we have a treaty in 1835, we have a treaty, um, but they don't necessarily mean the same thing, right? The, the state of the, of the United States is different. The rules of the game are different. Um, and in fact, over the course of the 19th century, uh, the United States moves away from George Washington's vision um, of sort of, uh, of formal treaty-based relations with native nations to in fact ignoring or refusing even 
to engage in treaty negotiation with Native nations as the United States expands further west across the continent. So what I wanna do now is just spend a few minutes um, sort of looking at the fall and the return um, of Native American treaty rights over the course of the 20th century. Right? Um, and here, um, sort of looking again at how people challenge removal or challenged broken treaties. Now, the story here um, sort of, again, brings us a little further ahead into uh, right around the turn of the century, right? Um, this photograph is from 1902 um, of Lone Wolf um, and has to do with the Supreme Court case, Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock. Uh, Gilbert, uh, Gilbert Hitchcock was the Secretary of the Interior. Now, um, Lone Wolf was resisting the allotment of Kiowa lands um, in what we would in the Great Plains, um, what is now Nebraska. Um, and what he, he his challenge um, says that the United States made a treaty in 1867 with the Kiowa Nation, the so-called Treaty of Medicine Lot. Um, and he sort of, uh, but in the intervening years between 1867 and 1903, Congress has announced that it is no longer going to make treaties with Native American nations, right? that Congress is just going to make policy, right? And notice that's a really important turning point, right? Because there Congress is saying, we don't recognize your nations as nations, right? We're not going to tr make treaties with you. We're not going to negotiate. Um, we're not going to have that give or take, right? When I asked you, what does diplomacy mean? Many of you said it, it involves compromise. It involves give, give and take, but it also involves respect, respect for nationhood. Um, and Congress has said, we're not going to do it, right? Lone Wolf says, yeah, but this treaty is still in force. And he brings it in, uh, to, to the Supreme Court. And in 1903, Lone Wolf and the Kiowa lose. Right, that Congress, uh, that, that uh, the Supreme Court says only Congress um, can set Indian policy. And if they choose to, to violate treaties, that's perfectly within the rights of Congress to do so. Congress's power is, as the, as the Supreme Court says, plenary, meaning it covers everything. Right? Now that, that policy remains the case for most of the 20th century, right? Um, uh, but there are dissenting voices. Um, and this leads me to one of my favorite quotes in American history, um, in a case that is itself not that important um, in Supreme Court history, Federal Power Commission versus Tuscarora Indian Nation. And it's one where once again, the Tuscarora Nation basically loses the case. But um, this makes uh, Justice Hugo Black um, uh, of Alabama um, very upset. And, and he has a dissenting opinion, and, uh, but it has a, a really great line in it. He says, great nations, like great men should keep their word, right? And you start to see a turning point by the 1960s, by the 1970s, particularly as an American Indian movement is emerging, um, as Native Americans and their advocates are understanding the power of legal court cases and sort of building resources to, to, to file them, inspired by the civil rights movement and everything that came after Brown versus Board of Education. Right? And so you see a series of legal challenges um, that sort of insist that there are treaty rights and they are still in force. There's a key turning point here in 1974 um, in a federal court case in Washington state, um, actually US v. Washington, um, which, uh, in which sort of native nations in the Puget Sound area um, who had been granted fishing rights in the Puget Sound um, under treaties that were still on the books um, claimed those fishing rights and were granted them by this federal court decision. This is a lower court decision, but it gets upheld and a whole bunch of other decisions follow from that, right? And that continues. And it continues all the way down um, until 2020, right? And that very uh, sort of uh, headline grabbing um, Supreme Court decision, uh, McGirt versus Oklahoma. Um, now, again, this is in some ways uh, not unrelated to the history of Indian removal and the so-called Trail of Tears. That the, what you are looking at here is a sort of map, um, this is actually from the 1890s, um, of uh, Indian Territory and uh, the Oklahoma Territory. Um, and uh, the Indian Territory was established by the treaties um, that launched the Trail of Tears, right? by, among others, the Treaty of Minnesota. Um, and in this case, one of them offered, quote, a permanent home to the whole Creek Indian, uh, whole Creek Nation of Indians. Right. And this is reaffirmed in an 1856 treaty 
um, with the Creek or as they're now most commonly known, the Scogie Nation. Now in the Supreme Court case in 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that this treaty from 1856 was in fact still in effect, right? And in fact, this recognized this land, almost all of this land as part of the Creek or Muscogee Nation. Um, but part of what it really did um, was affirm also that this power of Congress is still complete. It is still plenary. Right? And Congress still has that power because what the court decision really says is because Congress didn't um, abrogate the, the treaty, because Congress didn't uh, sort of undo the treaty, then the treaty is still in force. But that suggests that Congress still has that power uh, to break the treaty, right? So that, that, um, that, that whole position of lone wolf versus Hitchcock is still on the books. It's still the law of the land. Now, let me give you um, one more example and then uh, sort of we'll, I'll conclude um, and we can do some, some maybe a little Q&A now and a, and a little at the end. Um, that, uh, and here I wanna go back, not backing up from, from 2020 to, uh, to 1918. Right? And this is one of the sources that was in, uh, in the reading, uh, also coming from Chronicling America, the newspaper collection, um, when, in which the Onondaga nation declared war on Germany. Right? And so probably all of us, when we teach about the First World War, we have a map where we show here are all the countries that declared war against Germany and Austria-Hungary. Um, and probably we don't have the Onondaga on that list. Um, but in fact, they did declare war on Germany. Um, and uh, they had, as they thought, their own reasons for doing so. What they thought were very good reasons, right? That in the turn of the century, um, uh, in the early 20th century, um, when there was very little respect for Native American cultures and traditions, um, but also great fascination with them from uh, white Americans and Europeans and others, um, that uh, many Native, nation, Native Americans found themselves sort of either paid or coerced into participating in sort of public displays, sideshows, fairs, often quite demeaning and certainly not representative of their culture. Um, now there was a group of Onondaga Indians who were in Germany in 1914 when the war broke out. Um, and when war broke out between England and Germany, the United States was not involved, but um, tra travel between Europe and North America became very difficult. Um, and so, and then in April of 1917, when the United States and Germany go to war, suddenly the Onondaga Indians are sort of in, are imprisoned as enemy aliens. Right? They are sort of deemed a threat um, to the Germans. And this combination of demeaning the Onondaga as a people um, and imprisoning the Onondaga nation um, after sort of putting them in these sideshows was just too much for Onondaga leaders. Right? And so they met in the summer of 1918 and they declared war on Germany. Right? Now, uh, did, they send, did they send troops to fight against Germany? Yes, um, many Native Americans participated um, in the war. Um, apologies if there's some beeping in the background. Uh, so the Onondagas are participating in the war. They are fighting against Germany. Uh, but they're also using this as a, an opportunity to claim nationhood, right? So uh, you probably can't read it on the screen right here, but go back to the source in the source packet, right? That, that by the terms of a treaty with, with none other than General George Washington and 23 chiefs of the Onondaga tribe in 1783, the Onondaga were declared a separate nation in the United States and both sides have always respected the treaty, right? So notice, they are declaring themselves a nation. They are doing a sovereign thing, right? And in the middle of World War I, what do sovereign nations do? They declare war on each other and they're going to be part of it, right? Now, of course, they also want to do this because they know that at some point there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a peace treaty. Um, there's going to be a sort of treaty ending the war in Europe. And President Woodrow Wilson has announced his 14 points. Right? And he has been talking at some length about the rights of small nations and that the sovereignty and territory of small nations shall be protected. Now, when Woodrow Wilson says this in 1918, he's thinking about Belgium, right? He's thinking about Europe, right? But if you are a small nation like the Onondaga, if you want to be sort of respected and taken seriously, 
if you want a seat in this, this new thing called the League of Nations that Woodrow Wilson and others are talking about, then acting like a nation and declaring war on Germany and sending Onondaga soldiers to war is part of that effort, right? Now that's not all immediately visible in a short article in the newspaper, but it's important to kind of think once again, as we do with all sources, what's the motivation? You know, so what's the interest? Where's the conflict, right? And asking those kinds of questions about the sources can help us sort of get through um, to, uh, to, to this. All right, so let me just um, wrap up with sort of one, you know, maybe one or two things, uh, which is sort of, um, in part, I'll, I'll set up sort of how we can find sources and how we can use them, how we can get students to ask critical questions about them, um, but also sort of, you know, kind of why we might do so. And like I said, it's important um, to sort of, you know, to kind of put Native American nations as nations um, at the sort of heart of this story. Um, and one of the things is that I always tell students um, in the classroom, right, that when we look at this history uh, of Native Americans, we shouldn't assume uh, that the United States always wins and Native nations always lose, right? That there are, you know, there are moments of winning and losing, right? Um, but there are also ways in which, you know, in a moment of losing land, right, or losing uh, territory or resources, Native nations could also claim other wins. They could claim sovereignty, they could claim respect, right? Or um, they would take 200 year old claims of sovereignty like the Onondaga did and use it to claim a, a space on the na national stage. Right? And then when we as teachers, if we don't sort of take those claims seriously, then you know, we're not also taking Native American history and culture seriously, right? And it's important for us to do that. Um, I always say that you know we and uh, when we deal with difficult histories like this, we can't necessarily redress all the wrongs of the past in our classroom, but we can start by redressing sort of the wrongs of historians, right, uh, and how we tell our history, and how we teach it um, to future generations. So I'll stop there and turn it back over to uh, to Lynn and Elena. There we go. Um, Lynn is having some technical difficulties with her Zoom. Uh, she cannot access the control panel and her screen has gone white. <laughs> so um, I will jump in here and talk about uh, using primary sources to inspire NHD topics. And if Lynn can join us at any point, I'm sure she will, but uh, she sent me a picture and her whole screen is mostly white. So <laughs> we will hope mine doesn't do the same as I'm talking. So I'm just gonna share my Q and A. Do we see? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking about using primary sources from the Library of Congress to inspire NHD topics. And I know Lynn and I had a lot of fun looking for sources uh, to put this section of the PowerPoint together. All right, so oops, let's jump to where we are. Okay, so the first thing I want to start with is this image of Barbie. I love medical history. I love learning about women in medicine. So I saw this image in the news last month. Mattel released uh, six first responder Barbies. And I just thought this was very interesting, but I was also very interested as somebody who's interested in medical history. But say a student just saw this image on social media or online in the news, and they we're thinking about, I would like to do a project about women in medicine. How did women get into medicine? This is a great jumping off point to get students to think about how did women even end up in the medical profession? Was it always easy? Was it hard? What was it like? So we can look at these three sources that come from the Library of Congress's Chronicling America. And just three, these sources um, will show you that it wasn't easy for women in medicine in the 1850s and 60s. So the first little snippet we have here is from the Evening Telegraph. 
And this is November of 1869, just to set the scene. And this happened in Philadelphia. There was a big women's medical college in Philadelphia at the time. And the first newspaper article kind of gives us a rundown of what went on in November of 1869. So 30 ladies from the Women's Medical College were invited to the Pennsylvania Hospital to attend a lecture. But they were met with insults, jeering, thrown stuff at them. It was just not, not a good scene. So this first newspaper article just gives us a little overview of what happened. And then we see debates going back and forth uh, between different groups of people who read about this event in the newspaper. So the second is actually from the New York Herald and it was published in the Evening Telegraph in Philadelphia just a few days later. And this article talks about how disgusting and cowardly these men were at the lecture and that they, they, there's a line in here, they behave like professional ruffians more than professional gentlemen. It goes on and on about how terrible these men who are supposed to be professionals treated these women who are in the medical profession who are attending a medical lecture. And then the third article is in response. So it's the men's perspective of the event. And it basically boils down to these medical students saying, well, if the women want to be subjected to this type of clinical lecture, they should have to attend separately and have their own separate instruction. We don't want them with us in our lectures. So you can see here that the early history of women in medicine, and as you continue on in the history of women in medicine, could be filled with all sorts of debates, um, maybe diplomacy. So this is just kind of a jumping off point, just looking at women in medicine in those early days. And then we're going to look at diplomacy through turning points in history. So we picked three different turning points. So the first is the purchase of Alaska in 1867. So you can think with students, how did Alaska become a state? And we can look at these two primary sources to inspire students to start thinking about topics with Alaska history. So Alaska was brought into the United States in 1867. It was previously owned by the Russian Empire who wanted Pacific settlement in North America, but they couldn't defend it, they couldn't pay for it. So they wanted to sell it to the United States um, the United States was going through a civil war, so they could not take it at the time, but in 1867, they bought it for $7 million. And everybody thought that it was a folly. They called it Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox, but then gold was discovered in Alaska. So what was the perspective of the United States? What was the perspective of the Russian Empire after they found out about this? what was the perspective of the indigenous population that was in Alaska at this time? So lots of different ways that students can think about topics within the purchase of Alaska in 1867 through the Library of Congress resources we have here. And then we can also look at Hawaii and how Hawaii became uh, under the United States. So before the United States owned Hawaii in 1898. The first image we have here is of the Catholic Church. And when they came to Hawaii in 1854, so you can see, this was published in San Francisco. You can see that there's a school, there's courthouses, there's armory, there's a palace, there's custom houses, and there's a very specific view of Hawaii here. Then when the United States takes over Hawaii in 1898, we see a change in the imagery around Hawaii. So in this second photo, this is from 1938. This is an advertisement from the Pan American Airways. How have the views of Hawaii changed since before and after the United States owned Hawaii? What can we, um, what do we consider about who created these images? What do native Hawaiians think about the time of 1854 versus 18, 1938? So this is just another way that students can start to think about um, topic ideas using these images of primary sources. And then the final one is the Iran hostage crisis. So a lot of times students take inspiration from films they've seen. So the movie Argo about the Iran hostage crisis. So here we just have two images 
that could inspire students in lots of different ways. So the first image, the image on the left, is protests by Iranian students in Washington, DC. This is on November 8th, 1979, just four days after the hostages were taken. And then we have on the right, reporters at the White House is taking notes while President Jimmy Carter explained the failed rescue attempts for these hostages. And this was April 25th, 1980. So students can look at these different perspectives of the crisis, look at any internal debates, debates between student groups, diplomacy, failed diplomacy. So they can just take these images as a jumping off point for different research as they go on. And then we're going to look at asking questions. So this is, I know in my discussion group, uh, we had a lot of us were talking about using political cartoons as a, a great way to introduce students to primary sources because everybody can say something about a political cartoon. Uh, so here we have the political cartoon called Our Indian Policy, and this was published September 14th, 1881. So we can see Uncle Sam sitting in the middle here, and there's like a house of cards that is crumbling down the middle that say Indian policy on them. So you can easily ask students questions about who is in this cartoon, why are they in this cartoon? What's happening? You can see two people trying to blow down the house of cards. You can see different groups of people in this picture. So this is a great way to just introduce students to a topic and get them asking questions. And it's very low stakes entryway into primary sources. And then we have another primary source. This one's called Pray Keep Moving Brother. And this is a Herbert Block cartoon published in 1960. And this is an editorial cartoon and it's showing a man urging an African-American man to move along and not consider the first segregationist church, which claims to be the brotherhood of man. So there's lots of different questions that students can ask about this political cartoon and it starts to uncover some debates within religion and the civil rights movement. It's a great jumping off point to talk about um, the different aspects of the civil rights movement. And then finally, we have common interests. So I know a lot of times when I was working with students to think about their National History Day topic, they were like, I don't even know what I wanna do. <laughs> and so I was like, well, what do you like? Uh, and then we would search the Library of Congress for primary sources, just to kind of serve as the jumping off point. So a lot of students would say, I like sports. Um, so I would be like, well, what kind of sports? <laughs> so a lot of students like baseball. So this is the Union Soldiers at Salisbury, North Carolina POW camp. So this is an 1863 painting by Major Otto Bot. Bottinger, and this shows the Union prisoners playing baseball in the POW camp. That just, to me, is a jumping off point. Why are they in this camp? Why are they allowed to play sports in this camp? Uh, was baseball popular at the time? Did everybody know how to play baseball? So there's lots of different questions you can start to ask about baseball in the time of the Civil War. The next one we have here is an image. So if you have students that are very interested in film, the Library of Congress has lots of different film collections students can look at. So this is a film of the Brooklyn Bridge to New York filmed on a train. And this was made in 1899. So this film shows the entire trip taken from Brooklyn to New York. And at the time, it was the best picture of the Brooklyn Bridge yet taken. So that just can bring a number of questions like what technology was available at the time? What were they filming on? How long was this film? How long could they film? Who would have seen this film? And start to ask some questions based on this uh, primary source clip. And the last piece that I have for you is this piece of music. Uh, we heard in one of our videos that we had for the class, um, our first module was an intro to all the sources that the Library of Congress had, and they have millions and millions of pieces of sheet music. And this is just one of them. Uh, this is called a World's Fair, and I had to look up the pronunciation of this, Shottish, um, by Mrs. Eva B. Wilkinson. So written by a woman, 
in the year 1892 for the 1893 World's Fair. So there's plenty of different ways students can use sheet music. For example, what is a shoddish? I had to look it up. It was a popular music and dance of the 1890s. Where were people doing this dance? Why were they doing this dance? What was the, the popular dance culture of the time? So it could be for students who are interested in music, but also students who are interested in dance, cultural history of the 1890s, early 1900s. So those are just a few interesting primary sources uh, to get you started, uh, to get students inspired for all these different resources at the Library of Congress. So now we're open for questions. And just as a reminder, please complete your feedback survey. So that's at tinyurl.com slash NHD ISR21. This is how you'll get credit um, for the class. And it will ask, ask you questions about tonight's webinar. So I'll open it up to questions. I know we are almost at, we are at eight o'clock. So if anyone has any questions, please ask them now. I'll also encourage people, you know, and, and some of you have already been doing this in the discussion boards to link this to, to local histories, right? Um, and I think, you know, depending on what grade level um, you're, you're working with, um, you know, there are definitely, um, you know, sort of people who are teaching state level history local histories in ways that connect with, you know, what's the Native American history here and what are the connections of Native nations in our area to the United States, right? It's so just, you know, tonight I talked about New York and Georgia and Washington and Oklahoma. So there's, you know, definitely lots of, um, you know, lots of places to connect this to, to local histories where there can be really rich primary sources and also artifacts, right? You know, so one of the things about doing a class on Zoom is you don't, you know, get don't get to get your hands on sort of, you know, stuff, but like, um, you know, if you go to New Echota, which is now sort of a National Park Service site, you can see sort of the printing press, right, that the Cherokee uh, Phoenix was printed on, right, and so there may be sort of local opportunities um, that, are, that are there. A lot of people just asked me to put the URL back up, but I also put it in the chat if you want to copy and paste it. I'm just so going I'm... through to see if there's any other questions that are not about the... I may, um, I'm going to grab one from, um, while you're looking, from uh, Libby, who asks, or what's the main audience and readership for the Cherokee newspaper um, uh, earlier, and sort of how do we uh, get students to sort of find these, right? Um, and I think, uh, as far as we know, that the, the the Cherokee Phoenix, you know, was was written and published for for the Cherokee Nation, right? Um, you know, sort of. Um, uh, but it was also very clear that it was going to circulate widely, right? Um, and so there was actually a sort of formal organization called Friends of the Cherokee. Um, these were mostly um, sort of, you know, nor mostly sort of white uh, Protestant Americans often coming kind of from the missionary movements, um, but also often with participation of, of you know, some, some free, free black people are participating in these friend movements as well. Um, and the Cherokee Phoenix sort of circulates to them, right? Um, and, it, and it's definitely sort of part of that. Um, so that would be one. Um, I think that, um, you know, one question just jumping in again sort of from um, Becky Dupre asked sort of, how do you, how do you really get started? Um, and I think, here, um, it's worth teaching, you know, with how do you get started with Library of Congress research? And we put on, uh, you know, on Google Classroom links to some videos that the Library of Congress has done. It's worth just sort of explaining to students what the Library of Congress is, right? And, you know, that's not quite like the library, like in our school, right? It has a kind of official role as a repository of sort of all things produced in, in America, right? And, uh, and not even that, it is sort of the world largest library it has sort of, uh, you know, window into everything, which means it can be a little bit hard to find exactly what you're looking for. Um, but what you'll see is there are several places, good entry points, and we'll, we'll put them in, in here, um, that, uh, you know, that, the, that you can, you know, get into uh, you know, sort of curated collections of primary sources. Maybe the Library of Congress did an exhibit on a topic that your students might be interested in for an NHD project. Right, or there may be even sort of teacher uh, resources and lesson plans on a topic. And so that can be really, um, you know, one good place. 
All right. Have you been going through any of these? Yeah. We have a question. Can I can you clarify what I heard on the J Treaty? Did you say that the United States often negotiated with Native nations because at the time they had more power or numbers? Yeah. Um, uh, yes. So that yes, that question from from Lewis and and yes, that um, you know obviously uh, many of the Native nations are not as large as Great Britain, um, but they are sort of um, you know they are not already defeated um, in ways that we often sort of assume or that history kind of teaches um, you know sort of teaches a, a, about this right um, and that in the 1790s the the six nations right the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois. Are, are strong and they have sort of enough sort of power um, militarily and otherwise um, that they could have gone to war with the United States if the United States had not made a treaty with them. So that's why I was comparing the Treaty of Canandaigua to the Jay Treaty, which of course with Britain does some of the same things, right? It prevents the United States from going to war again with Britain um, in 1794. In both cases, the United States, which is still kind of getting its feet as, as a country, um, is sort of realizing that diplomacy can avert war. Uh, I think what's interesting, and, and here, you know, uh, this is a whole other session, is of course the Native nations in what's now the Midwest, right, um, have their own diplomatic relations with Native nations even further west, right? Um, and so the Lakota, for example, are sort of in many ways the most powerful nation in North America for much of the, this early period. Um, and they're engaging in their own diplomacy with the Haudenosaunee and, and so forth. So, you know, really this diplomacy is working in lots of different directions. Right? Um, and again, it sort of reminds us of, of, of the power of, of these nations. I have a one question. Um, I'll answer it really quick. Any tips on navigating Chronicling America? I love using Chronicling America, but you, my biggest tip would be to use keywords. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can narrow down your search. So if you know what city an event happened in, what decade, you can even specify year, you can specify months. So when I was looking at this particular event in Philadelphia, November of 1869, I could put in November 1869, and I typed in um, just a key word from the event, and then that would highlight that word in all the various newspaper articles that that word was tagged in. So then I could go through those newspaper articles and it was a much, much less <laughs> articles than if I had just typed in like doctor. So the more specific keywords you can get and the more specific you can make your search, the better it will be to use. So it's definitely something that you'll wanna do a little research first just before jumping in so you know what you're looking for. Cause otherwise it can get a little overwhelming cause they just have so many newspaper articles um, from all of the country. So that would be my, my tip. I would add a, another exercise, and this takes a little longer, um, but to just get students to kind of know their way around a newspaper, especially because you know, many of them have not really spent much time with print newspapers, um, is to, to give them um, you know, sort of an assignment where they look up um, you know, their, their parents, you know, the day they were born, the day one of their parents was born, the day one of their grandparents was born, right? Or some other important people to them. And then they realize like, oh, you know, and then just look at the newspaper, you know, look at the advertisements, look at the headlines, um, look at the help wanted ads. Um, you know, that's more of like a, a full class period kind of experience, but it can be a really good thing. And then they realize there's always a moment of discovery. You know, like, you know, they realize, oh, a telephone used to cost like $300 or, um, you know, oh, the help wanted ads say help wanted male or help wanted female. Um, and those just, you know, it's a more of an investment of time, but it can be a good way of kind of letting the students um, you know, obviously older, more high school age students can do some of the, the discovery. Awesome. Well, it is 810. So I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, if we didn't answer your question, we will go through them and we will send you answers in the next day or so. Um, but Chris, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, uh, not right now. I think I will, um, I, what I'll, I will do is, um, you know, we'll make sure that there's a, there are a couple other sources I flagged tonight that were not in, in your resource packet, or we'll make sure that those get posted. 
Um, and, and just there's one last question that came through at the, at the end from uh, on uh, sort of what happens in Oklahoma after the discovery of oil. Um, and there's definitely sort of, you know, kind of uh, histories of, of that um, and it's kind of really, you know, kind of good, good suggestions. So um, I also encourage people, my email address is on the syllabus and I'm also always happy to kind of follow up with, with other questions and, um, you know, either in, in Google Classroom or, or just, you know, emailing me directly. And especially if some of the sources, if you have trouble tracking them down or can't quite, um, you know, find the Library of Congress keyword, just, just reach out because we'll be together all through the next four months. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Again, don't forget to fill out your survey. Uh, this is being recorded and it will go into your Google Classroom as soon as we uh, figure out what's up with Lynn Zoom <laughs> and get the recording up there um, and the link as well. Uh, thank you all so much. And again, if you, we didn't answer your question today, uh, we will send you answers in the next day or so. So thank you, everybody and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, poor Lynn. <laughs> I think this, this happened to me literally the other day, I was recording a Zoom and I got locked out of my Zoom. <laughs> so, uh, should we, is there another another way to, for us to record it in case Lynn's doesn't save? Um, I didn't push record. I didn't push record either. So I'm hoping when this happened to me the other day, Zoom kept recording and it was as if nothing was wrong. So I'm hoping that's what, what happens here. <laughs> All right, well, thanks again. <laughs> nice to meet you. I don't think we, we didn't work together before. Right now. Oh no, I'm filling in for